Hello and welcome to the third of six presentations in the Global Motivations Lecture Series. My name is Matthew Hughes and I serve as the Executive Director of the International Relations Council in Kansas City, and we're so glad to have you with us today. The International Relations Council strengthens Kansas City's global perspective by maintaining an active dialogue around world events, global issues, and their impact on our community. As a nonpartisan educational nonprofit organization, the IRC values informed civil discourse, accessibility, and substance as we work to sharpen our community's 21st century global acumen. Whether you're joining us live or viewing the recording later, we invite you to learn more about the International Relations Council, including other upcoming events and how to join the IRC as a member on our website at irckc.org. The global rebalance of power continues. The ambitions, alliances, and actions of world powers have accelerated shifts in the international order that was framed in the waning days of the Second World War. What interests countries on the world stage today? What outcomes do they seek and what role do cooperation and competition play? In the six part virtual series, we're painting a portrait of six world powers, their internal and external drivers, their evolving role in the community of nations and what this means for the rest of the world. We hope you'll engage with us today as we explore the motivations of the United Kingdom. We certainly welcome your thoughtful questions through the course of the conversation using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And do check out and share other IRC conversations as we consider a range of critical issues in the coming weeks. We're grateful to our sponsors who have made today's program and the Global Motivations Lecture Series possible. In particular, sustaining series sponsors, Cyprian Simkowitz and Jerry White, and the University of St. Mary, and supporting series sponsor, Burns and McDonald. Thanks also to supporting conversation sponsors, Kathy Allison and Commerce Bank. Thank you for finding value in these conversations. I'm now pleased to introduce our moderator for today's program, who will help us set the stage and introduce our speaker. IRC board member Aaron Mann is a principal with Terracon Consultants and is their general counsel for risk management, overseeing all litigation and claims for one of the largest engineering and design firms in the US. Prior to joining Terracon, Aaron represented international clients in US-based disputes and transactions and served as the head of Europe, Middle East and Africa services for an AmLaw 100 law firm. Aaron worked in London for four years and after returning to Kansas City, continued to serve as the liaison between the firm and affiliated law firms around the world. He's traveled for work and pleasure to more than 35 countries. Aaron, thanks so much for being with us today. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Matthew. I appreciate that. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Matt Beach, who joins us today. Dr. Beach is the director of the Center for British Politics at the University of Hull. He is a political scientist and historian who teaches post-war British political history, government, and the culture wars. He's a senior fellow at UC Berkeley's Institute for European Studies, which is a partner of the Center for British Politics at the University of Hull. Dr. Beach has held visiting appointments at Oxford, Berkeley, and Flinders University in Australia. Dr. Beach is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy, and a member of the Heterodox Academy. He's an elected member of the Executive Committee of the American Political Science Association's British Politics Groups, and he was a Thornycroft Memorial Scholar at the University, University of Southampton, where he studied for his PhD under Professor the Lord Plant of Highfield. Dr. Beach has authored and edited numerous publications on British politics. Additionally, he has spoken at events at the House of Commons, the House of Lords, and many other esteemed bodies. Dr. Beach provides expert analysis for the media and has appeared in various outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Financial Times, CNBC, the BBC World Service, and many, many others. He has over a decade of experience in knowledge exchange, including public policy consultancy. He's worked with parliamentarians, think tanks, trade unionists, businesses, local government officers, and journalists. And it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Matt Beach, who will tell us more about the global motivations of the United Kingdom. Dr. Beach, thank you again for being here today with the IRC. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for that generous introduction. 
Uh, and thank you so much to Matthew and, and the wider IRC team for inviting me uh, to give this lecture, uh, to have a conversation with yourselves and really to open it up to um, our friends who are live uh, in the room, so to speak. So please um, submit your questions and I would like to get through as many of those as possible. Uh, it's always good to hear from experts, but I really think that the, the real kind of magic in the room often happens in the dialogue. It's in the deliberation, it's in the conversation. So I'll try and get through as many of those as I can. So in this, in this series, we are looking at six um, world powers, global powers. And today I'm charged with looking at my own country, the United Kingdom. So I, I don't come at this um, with a sense of impartiality. I, I think that's impossible, but I do come at this with a sense of even handedness, um, being aware of the challenges, the limitations, and also the aspirations of the United Kingdom within the global community. It hasn't escaped um, anyone's attention, um, either side of the Atlantic, um, that Britain has uh, left the EU. And after 43 years of membership, Britain is now a meaningfully, uh, sovereignly independent country. And the debate about Brexit, which began in the run up to the 2016 referendum, uh, so a few years before that, then during the referendum, and then during the parliamentary and political gridlock afterwards, is the biggest political question in our country, in the United Kingdom, in the last 50 years. And in that sense, being outside of the federal polity of the European Union is the key um, political challenge for the United Kingdom um, in the foreseeable future. And what that means for um, our allies and our economic partners is how we relate to them vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. And we'll come on to that a bit, bit later on. So I would say my first point is the post-Brexit era is um, the most fundamentally uh, key factor. It's the foundational point. The fact that Britain is now no longer in the this largest of uh, economic trading blocks and, um, and, uh, and in what is a, in effect a United States of Europe, uh, which has a, a, a bank currency, uh, a flag, a civil service, um, a, a committee, a commission, um, it is quite notable. So that's the first thing. I think the other things that are, are, are much more immediate is we have a new prime minister, Elizabeth Truss. Uh, she's been prime minister for approximately one month. And, and, and she is the fourth prime minister that we've had in six years. Again, much of that is to do with uh, the, the, um, the tumult of Brexit, but um, and also the way that her predecessor um, was uh, forced from office. But also she is our, our third female prime minister. Uh, all of our three female prime ministers have come from the Conservative Party, not the Progressive Party, the Labour Party. And the other thing, I guess, which has escaped nobody's attention, is that we as a people are in a new era. We're in the era of King Charles III, um, but we also are not far from a period of mourning at the passing of our late Lady Sovereign, um, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. And um, the amount of well good wishes that I received from my friends in the United States about the passing of Her, Her Majesty was incredibly touching and supportive. Um, so Britain is at a crossroads, friends. It, it has a new prime minister, it has a new sovereign, it has a new political environment outside of the European Union, and we're getting used to that. Also, we're, we're the other side of COVID, let's not forget that, another phenomena that has affected the world, affected trade, affected how uh, people go about their everyday life, but affected how countries and allies and partners relate to each other. So we're the other side of Brexit, but we're also the other side of COVID as well. Um, and so for Britain, there is an awful lot of uh, events, there's been phenomena that have uh, affected Britain, disrupted normal practice of politics, shaken up established partnerships within parliament, all sorts of things. So Britain is at a crossroads. But I'd like to say a few things about continuity before I move on to discontinuity. There are many continuities. The United Kingdom continues to be um, a permanent member of the, of the UN Security Council. It continues to be a nuclear power. It continues to be um, the keystone partner of NATO in Europe. 
uh, along with America, who is the indispensable uh, partner within NATO. And let's not forget, it is because of the United States commitment in terms of uh, troops and weapons uh, since, uh, since the end of the Second World War um, that the North Atlantic Treaty Organization has lasted and that European collective security has been guaranteed. Sometimes I would have I heard it among some of my students during the Brexit negotiation, and sometimes from one or two colleagues during the Brexit negotiations, that if we left the EU, we'd be less safe. Well, if we left the EU, there would be lots of economic uncertainty for sure. And there were strong arguments for staying in the EU, and perhaps an economic continuity argument was the strongest one of all. But absolutely, what being in the EU did not provide the United Kingdom is any kind of um, security. That is because of NATO, and that at its core is because of the American support to, uh, to Europe from the threat of Russia. And now I've come on to that issue of Russia, and we see that very much now with the dreadful Russian invasion and illegal war in the Ukraine. And I think Britain has been perhaps the, the, the first uh, and the keenest um, particularly under Prime Minister Boris Johnson, um, ally in Europe, certainly, of the Ukraine. Uh, Johnson went, walked around Ukraine on two occasions. Britain's given uh, cash money as well as uh, military support, as well as other European nations. And uh, to try and enable uh, uh, President Zelensky and the Ukrainian uh, military and the people to uh, retake the land that had been um, so egregiously invaded by, by Putin's Russia. So um, we have continuities in terms of the UN Security Council, in terms of our critical role in NATO. We, ha we have uh, continuity in terms of the fact that our allies are still the same allies. Uh, our really close relationships between um, our European partners, especially France and Germany, and, but also uh, our, our very close relationships with the United States as well, and other members of the Commonwealth, uh, especially countries such as Canada and the and. Australia and New Zealand. And those five I've mentioned, the United States, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, are part of the Five Eyes Organization of Intelligence Gathering Sharing. That is also a continuity, and that is also an absolutely central partnership which keeps um, citizens in all of those countries and citizens actually in other countries safer from the threat of international terrorism in its various guises. So that has not changed at all. Britain is also still a nuclear power it has a nuclear deterrent. It has um, British-made submarines and British-made warheads and, and in, in the American uh, missiles um, in those submarines. So Britain has partnership with America about its nuclear deterrent, but it maintains um, a new, uh, its position as a nuclear power. And um, so there is much continuity, much continuity. But ladies and gentlemen, there are also discontinuities. I've alluded to the fact that Britain is in uncharted economic waters being outside of the EU. We, we desperately are seeking, and it's not looking like it's going to happen anytime soon, a free trade agreement with the United States. I think that's probably because there is a strong disagreement with this current um, Biden administration in Washington towards the United Kingdom, certainly a cooler attitude towards the United Kingdom than the previous administration uh, of President Donald Trump. Um, and so that's difficult for the United Kingdom. Um, also, Britain is probably now the fifth round of negotiations with India. It, Britain very much wants a free trade uh, deal with India. And um, so these are the things we're hoping that that will happen by the end of the year. Perhaps it will be next year. So whilst many deals have been signed, many smaller free trade agreements, and medium sized free trade agreements, free trade agreements with Japan, with South Africa, with, with Canada, with, Caribbe with the Caribbean islands, with, with many, many European countries outside the EU, with other African nations, with um, South American nations. It's very important economically that Britain has a free trade deal with India and incredibly important with the United States. And I've said, I don't think that's happening anytime soon. So I think that's difficult. I think that's challenging in terms of political economy. That's I think, I think, so I think the other thing, um, apart from, from that, which is a discontinuity, is the fact that um, the British government uh, of Liz Truss has recently had a budget and um, it, it didn't show its working, so to speak. It didn't have a, a costings document from the, the Independent Office of Budgetary Responsibility. And it proposed a huge amount of tax cuts and a large amount of funding, uh, sorry, borrowing, deficit borrowing. 
and that has spooked the markets, especially the currency markets. And so the pound has had a torrid time over the last few weeks, not just against the dollar, but particularly against the dollar. And we have a situation where um, there's great concern about pension funds, great concerns about the, um, the kind of the, the ability of the United Kingdom to borrow, uh, to fund um, the gap in revenue that these tax cuts will uh, eventually uh, lead to. So at the moment, things are really kind of difficult. Again, another discontinuity is the fact that we are facing here at home 10% inflation. Now I spent three months in California and it was about eight, 9% in California this summer, but not quite as high as it is in the UK. But that is a discontinuity. In my lifetime, you you would have to go, you would have to really go back to um, the the early early 1990s to have inflation at incredibly high levels like that. So inflation being that high puts huge cost pressures on families and households and businesses. It ma makes everybody the, the great the great um, impact of inflation makes everybody poorer, and it makes the poorest poor still but it erodes savings, it erodes wealth. And of course, unless your wages keep up with uh, cost pressures with the rate of rising prices, inflation, in other words, people have a real terms pay cut. And so again, another discontinuity we're having in the United Kingdom right throughout the summer, and it looks like into this winter, is we have lots of labor unions going on strike. And there's gonna be almost like a, a viral bidding war for for increased wages because people feel that quite rightly they're getting poorer because of inflation. But the, we we've no, we've no, we know the outcome of that from old, from 78, 79, what we call the winter of discontent, where one strike led to another in it. And these labor unions kind of um, almost had a domino effect on other labor unions. And then there was kind of, you know, gridlock and, and a real kind of um, crisis in public services. So we don't want to go back to the 1970s. But um, it, it's looking rather, it's a very challenging environment. And someone said to me, do you actually think this is one of the most challenging environments for an incoming prime minister in recent memory? And I think it probably is, actually. I think, I mean, Theresa May had a torrid time facing um, Brexit. She was a Remainer. She wanted to stay in. Uh, Britain had voted to leave. The Conservative Party was divided, as it is to this day, on that question. So she had a torrid time. But I think this is perhaps more difficult because obviously we've had, you know, got the war in Ukraine, which is causing the energy crisis, which is really putting huge amount of inflation in the world economy, and the fact that we've come out of COVID and the, the lack of production during COVID because the lockdowns or shelter in place, as the Americans call them, meant that there was much less productivity. And so if there's scarcity for certain goods, and that's also a huge dose of inflation in the global economy. So those two things together, I think, and of course, we've had the the national kind of trauma of losing Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II puts Britain's Britain is in a difficult position. But I do think there are continuities, and I do think that the United Kingdom, with its open and and, and uh, liberal form of capitalism, and its um, its tolerant nature, welcoming immigrants coming in and and, and doing lots of uh, trade and wanting to be a dynamic market economy with a social safety net, looking for true free trade, looking to build upon. Uh, historic links with partners, especially partners where we share the same values, um, puts us in a good position, even though we're experiencing very choppy waters, very challenging economic and domestic situation with um, inflation and with strikes. And um, but in a way, we've been there before. Um, on the on the plus side, this is a boon for the Her Maj His Majesty's opposition, the, the Labour Party, that's the main centre-left progressive party in the United Kingdom. They are incredibly uh, ahead of the Conservative government in the polls. The leader, Keir Starmer, is way out ahead of uh, Elizabeth Truss, our Prime Minister, in the polls. And um, perhaps they should be, because they've been out of office for 12 years, and the Conservatives have been in power for 12 years. Uh, the Conservatives have won the last four elections. And, and, so, and we've had four Conservative Prime Ministers. So in one sense, the, the Labour Party ought to be ahead. There won't be a general election for a till 2024, probably around May. So by that time, we will have had one party, even though we will have had four different leaders and different governments formed from the different traditions of the very broad Conservative Party we have, they would have been in power for 14 years. So the, the, the Labour Party um, are looking uh, in better shape than they were a few years ago when uh, Jeremy Corbyn was leader. He was leader for five years. And um, uh, from 15 to 20, and very much uh, a left-wing socialist, and um, yes, yeah, so I think I think the 
the takeaway for folks listening today, there are there are there are genuine continuities in terms of defence, diplomacy, um, partnership, um, Britain's attitude towards its allies, also towards its adversaries, and continuity in the sense that our uh, um, we we've, we have um, a, a new monarch and our constitutional monarchy, which is very much part of the British constitutional settlement, smoothly and peacefully uh, transitions. But at the same time, there's also an era of discontinuity and therefore disruption, not just leaving the EU, but trying to find free trade deals, uh, getting back to work like everyone post COVID and, and trying to get back to normal, uh, but also very much in an era of incredibly high inflation and uh, an, an energy crisis and, and union, uh, union strikes. So it's jolly challenging, it's jolly challenging. But um, I don't see uh, the elites in the Labour Party or the Conservative Party or the British Civil Service anytime soon uh, thinking that these events are terminal. Um, they certainly are challenging. And I think the other thing that's important is a bit of comparison. Germany, obviously, in the EU, is facing similar levels of inflation. Germany in the EU is also struggling economically uh, with less production um, because of COVID um, and also with its own internal difficulties, uh, very different, different set of difficulties. Um, you could say similar sort of things for Italy with a new government and also France. And so being in the EU doesn't make you, doesn't keep you immune from cost pressures and, and global inflation, doesn't keep you immune from the impact of a uh, an aggressive Russia on Europe's on, on Europe's eastern border. It doesn't keep you immune from the global pandemic. But um, there's no two ways about it. The, the greatest challenge for the United Kingdom outside the EU would be forging free trade agreements and trying to navigate a, an economic journey. Um, I think perhaps Britain is better placed than some because our capitalism is more open. In Britain, we would say liberal. It means a different thing in the United States. It's more kind of dynamic, I would say. Than the sort of Rhineland model in Germany and the more etatist sort of top-down centralist model in France. So I think perhaps our economic perspective means we're better placed for that and with our strong links through the Commonwealth and through and through many partners, but it's very difficult, incredibly challenging the environment. And many of the problems that, that we face are actually faced by our, our European neighbours as well. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to leave it there because I'd like as much time as possible for questions. I know Aaron's uh, got some questions for me. Um, he's probably um, squirreled some notes down and he's going to ask me some tough ones. So thank you so much. And Aaron, I'll hand back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Beach. I appreciate that. Um, and I, I, I certainly, um, you know, the, the idea of continuity and discontinuity, that absolutely resonated with me. This is a, this is a time of tremendous change. Uh, but obviously, as you said, there are a lot of things that, that continue much in the, in the same way they have. Um, one question I, that, that, that I have to ask, and I, and I heard you say that, that Brexit essentially is kind of the key political challenge, the fundamental political question. At what point, and, and you know, I, I don't think there's a date necessarily, but perhaps there's an event. At what point does this process reach its conclusion? You know, we're, we're six years on from the vote, we're two years on from uh, kind of that, that separation. I guess the, the, the question I have is, you know, we're, we're as, as, as the UK is still working on issues such as um, the border in Northern Ireland, you know, at, at, at what point can, can you know, the, the rest of the world look and say, okay, this is now what this relationship between the UK and Europe looks like going forward? Well, that's an incredibly insightful question. Um, I'll give an unsatisfactory answer. In the first instance, purely in a procedural, legal, institutional sense, it was the end of January 2020 with the EU Withdrawal Act. So Britain is a meaningfully sovereign nation now. There is no foreign superintending court um, saying to uh, Great Britain, at least, um, you have to do this and you have to do that. Um, the 650 men and women we elect every five years to the House of Commons, they are sovereign. Because uh, Parliament in so is really where what is sovereign in the United Kingdom, whereas in the United States, and I guess in the United Kingdom and in all democracies, we say the people are sovereign, but really it is the constitution in the United States, which is kind of sovereign. You can amend it, of course, two thirds majority in Congress, but it is the, it is the site of power and, 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 and authority 
is the constitution in the US. In the United Kingdom, it's not. It's parliament. No parliament can bind its successor. So those 650 men and women that we elect, that's an awful lot, isn't it? That we elect every uh, five years, they are sovereign. They were not meaningfully sovereign when they had to take instruction from a foreign uh, superintending court, even though you thought it was a very, might have been a very reasonable court in the European Court of Justice or from European or from European institutions, because if EU law conflicted and co collided, Aaron, with the United Kingdom law, EU law took precedence. So in a very, in a legal constitutional sense, that ended meaningfully, immediately, at the end of, at the end of January 2020. But you're quite right. The Northern Irish Protocol is the biggest issue in, in uh, domestic politics, in politics, uh, the biggest issue in economics is obviously this, the inflation, runaway inflation. But everyone, many people, many countries have got that. We have a hard border in the Irish Sea. What does that mean? Part of the EU withdrawal agreement is something called the Northern Irish Protocol. Your your uh, your members are here. I'm very learned. I'm sure they know about it. What does that mean? There is in effect a border right down the middle, an invisible border in the Irish Sea between Great Britain, that's, that's Wales, Scotland, and England and Northern Ireland, the fourth nation of the United Kingdom. Why is that there? Well, the fourth nation of the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland, shares a contiguous border with the Republic of Ireland, which is an EU member state. And so any goods that come um, east-west from Great Britain into Northern Ireland have to, under this protocol, have to be checked. Now that leads to stickiness and time delays and costs for businesses, but it also has actually changed the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, um, because anything that changes Northern Ireland's standing within the United Kingdom, according to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, had to receive consent from both the unionist and the nationalist communities. And that, that didn't happen. So the unionists quite right a jolly cross about that. It's given extra kind of piquancy and urgency by two factors. The first, um, the, the Republicans, Sinn Féin, for the first time have won a majority in the Northern Irish Parliament, Stormont. Um, and secondly, the, the, we have a decennial census, census throughout the United Kingdom every 10 years. It's just been published and what's it's found. There's a majority of Catholics for the first time in Northern Ireland. But that does not mean necessarily that they're all going to vote for nationalists, let alone for the Republican Sinn Féin. Although generally speaking, Catholics tend to vote nationalists and Protestants vote unionists. But sometimes more you know, middle-class Catholics might vote unionist or middle-class Protestants in certain places might vote for the moderate nationalists, depending on the issues. But generally speaking, it splits ethnographically. So when you add the census numbers and you add Sinn Féin's breakthrough for the first time, um, and that Stormont is now in gridlock because the unionists won't back a speaker of the house because they're concerned about all these issues, that's not good. And we one thing that we know within our islands, you don't want stagnation on this issue. Uh, we, we, we we want peace and we want Belfast Northern Irish uh, Good Friday Agreement, beg pardon, to last and stand. So the government's in a pickle. It will have to go back to the EU and try and renegotiate some of these terms. Or it doesn't, and it just rips it up and it just says, look. As a matter of first principles, a nation state must be able to secure its borders as a matter of first principles. That will mean, in effect, ripping up an international treaty. Um, so the, the UK government, the Conservatives knew what they were doing under Boris Johnson when they signed this. They knew that it was going to cause difficulties down the line. Now this is on Liz Truss's plate. So this is very difficult. I appreciate that very much. So uh, kind of dovetailing with that, uh, I know that there has been a fair bit of talk both from Scotland um, and from and from Northern Ireland as well about you know potentially whether it's independence, do further devolution, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. uh, what 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 does that what does that look like in the near future from yeah. you know from, from the UK standpoint in terms of how to how to work with these elements that want to, you know, quite frankly, break away? Sure. Okay, let's stay on Northern Ireland because we were just talking about that. So um, Sinn Féin is the Republican Party. Um, their goal is a united Ireland. Uh, their goal is for Northern Ireland to be part of um, the rest of the, uh, of the Republic of Ireland. Um, 
and they've just won a majority for the first time. Now that's not enough. It, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. It's necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition for a border poll. Um, so, and there are, there are very key criteria that has to be met for that to happen. And, and I think we're a way off that. Scotland, obviously they had a referendum in 2014 and uh, a majority of Scots um, decided that they wanted to remain in the United Kingdom. Now, the Scottish National Party, who are the separatist party who want to break up the United Kingdom, they've been in power since 2007. Um, Scotland voted to stay in the EU. Uh, and so what the SNP have been saying is we deserve to have a second referendum, even though the Edinburgh Agreement, which was the, uh, the agreement between the Scottish government and the UK government at the time, to um, for, at the time of the first referendum said, look, this is a once in a generation event. We're not going to have uh, these polls every few years at the, at the fancy of any SNP leader that wants it. But what the SNP are arguing for is, well, actually, yes, you're okay. It's not a change in, uh, it's not a difference in generation. It's only been sort of eight, eight, eight years, but we, the United Kingdom has left the EU. That, that is a constitutional political change. That's true it is. And the majority of Scots argue that we should stay in. That's also true. So they're saying because of that, they should have the right to have a have a second referendum. This Conservative government, like the previous one, is not going to countenance that. And we mustn't forget the Conservative Party's full title, full official name, is the Conservative and Unionist Party. So it's for the Union of the United Kingdom. Incidentally, the Labour Party, the progressive opposition, is a unionist party. So um, I think it's more likely in my lifetime that Scotland may uh, have a have a second referendum or a third referendum, a bit like Quebec in Canada, but actually vote to leave. I think it would be incredibly bad economics for Scotland because there are only five million people, um, and they have you know an advanced welfare capitalist state with all sorts of social transfers and and benefits. Um, also, there's a thorny question of the currency. Would they create a new currency? I don't think a British government would give them the pound. So they have to create and new currencies, as you know, are highly inflationary. It doesn't necessarily follow that you get straight back in the EU. European Central Bank quite correctly have very tight rules on any country coming in to a system because you don't want new, new countries coming in where there's going to be inflation or runs on that currency or what have you. So to think that you could seamlessly move from the pound, however volatile the pound sterling often is, into the euro, I don't think necessarily follows. I think you have to go through steps. So I think that's very difficult for them. But that's before even talking about a whole range of things such as, you know, can their tax base sustain their public expenditure? And it can't. I mean, they're already egregiously in deficit. And that's because and that's because of their, how they spend money. Uh, how the SNP government have spent money, even though uh, Scots, Scottish people per head of population are funded better than English uh, citizens under something called the Barnet formula, which is a form of preferential, prefer preferential funding formula. The Northern Irish get the most, then I think the Welsh, then the Scots, and then the Brits. Um, Northern Ireland gets the most because the, the formula was devised quite understandably during the Troubles during the Civil War. And so you could never get private, very much private investment in in, in Northern Ireland during during the 30 years of the trouble. So, you know, they needed more public spending, absolutely. I wonder if we could transition to, uh, I suppose, relations between the, the, the UK government and some of the governments on the continent. Um, and specifically we're looking at, at Italy, which is uh, now had some very, very significant changes with, with a, a very far right government coming into power. Um, you have the, uh, the, the, the French, who have also seen a rise in the far right, not, not to the same extent as Italy. How does, how does the, the UK, you know, in its kind of traditional role, uh, interact now with, with some of these, these new governments and, and, and emerging parties? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I, I think um, we have open uh, diplomatic relationships with all European countries. Um, I think the alliance between Portugal and Britain is the oldest diplomatic alliance in the world, I think. I might be wrong about that. So if I am, let your listeners email me and correct me. But I think it might be the oldest alliance. But um, yeah, I, um, 
an open uh, diplomatic relationship regardless of who is in government. Now, of course, there are certain constraints. Let's say, hypothetically, you're dealing with a country that is not democratic, that is not constitutional, that is um, run by fiat or, or run by um, a, 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 an autocratic class or a single authoritarian. Then, of course, um, one's, uh, one's ambassadors and cons, uh, consuls general and the mission has a very different, a very different modus operandi, obviously. But when we're talking about European countries, when we're talking about first world constitutionally uh, bounded countries, then I, to some extent it's business as usual. Of course, the United Kingdom government will have particular concerns with particular partners because they might want they have a trading perspective or they might need some support on um, other aspects of defense or soft power. But I, I would have thought um, with France and Germany, uh, with France and, and Italy, um, I, I would have thought to some extent it would be a normal footing. It would be the, it would be the normal approach and, and where you agree. You build on that and you build trust and relationships and our ambassadors do a fantastic and the whole missions do a fantastic job of that. Communicating um, His Majesty's government's agenda, seeking uh, points of intersection where we can build uh, partnerships and trust and help each other. And also, if there are on issues where we disagree, to respectfully raise those. So how, how do you contrast that then with the uh, the UK's relationship and, and perhaps their goals for a relationship with with China. Yes, well, I think that's I think that's incredibly difficult given um, the egregious human rights abuses um, in Hong Kong or in, with the Hong Kongers from Beijing, um, and also with the Uyghur Muslims uh, out in the West, and also with the with the huge Chinese Christian community, the huge underground church uh, and. And this is a difficult thing because China is so is such a, a central economic power in the world economy, manufacturer. And if we really are talking about, and I think we still do live in a bipolar world. I think we and, and those two worlds, those two poles are the United States and their China. Uh, they're, they're not the United States and the Soviet Union or its successor, Russia, anymore, not at all. But they, they, they are China. So we have, to some extent, two empires uh, and, um, and so two, two, do, two dominant um, nations. As empires are as old as humanity. There have always been empires and there always will be. Uh, they take on different formats. They're not all the same. They're different in values and character. And, uh, and you can't get more different in values and character than the People's Republic of China and the United States of America. And so how does the United, the United Kingdom tries to be, tries to have civil and frank relationships with China, but also aware that China is not just a rival, but often actually a, um, an adversary. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm going to go to some of the questions that the audience has been asking. And, um, and just as a reminder, if you have questions, please, by all means, use the, use the Q&A function. So the first question that's been asked is uh, whether the influence and power of the UK is going to diminish over the next 10 to 20 years, or will the country be able to turn around that trend? And if so, what would be the key elements of such a turnaround? Um, I think the United Kingdom's, well, I don't think the hard power changes it very much at all in terms of um, His Majesty's nuclear uh, deterrent with um, our nuclear submarines, uh, His Majesty's um, Navy, Royal Navy. So I just don't think that that hasn't changed being in Brexit, out of Brexit or what have you that, at all, or with this change of government. So I think that stays the same. I think also the the prime, you know, the, the, the level of respect and funding that is given to the brilliant men and women of our security services who keep us safe uh, in our beds at night from enemies, foreign and domestic. I, I think that's that's a continuity. So that's partly soft and partly hard power. I think one of the things that is interesting is soft power. The United Kingdom normally is very, very highly ranked on soft power, partly because of our, uh, our cultural impact around the world, uh, not just through ideas and language uh, and, and um, cultural exports, but also through our universities and through our inventions and our patents and our companies. 
um, but also because of the tradition that the United Kingdom has, regardless of who's in power, Labour or Conservative, regardless of who's in power, about being an engaged international actor, about caring about human rights, never being perfect, never having a perfect history, but caring about human rights, uh, about caring about conservation, uh, about caring about the rights of people who are refugees. That's not the same as economic migrants needs to be, that point needs to be made. Often my students conflate the two things. It's really important we don't conflate the two things. Uh, but in terms of refugees, I think you, that Britain has a strong, a strong story to tell. So I think in those, in those, issue, in those areas, uh, when, when you knit all that together, Aaron, you could call that soft power. Uh, the impact of um, some of our better broadcasters. I mean, I think in most countries we struggle with journalism and we struggle with commentary rather than reportage. But some some of the better outlets are still quite good at reportage, and that's absolutely essential, really, for so for for trust in democracies, and also being able to tell truth to power and shine a light and criticise. So I think some of the things I've sketched out are institutions and practices, and conventions of our soft power. Now, I don't think that diminishes necessarily, but of course it waxes and wanes. And of course, it's it's also relative. Other there are so many other vital countries in the world um, who are fantastically um, open countries that are, uh, have, have, are market capitalist countries, uh, have um, um, constitutional settlements, either constitutional republics or parliamentary, constitutional parliamentary systems who um, treat their citizens with dignity and treat uh, visitors and refugees also with dignity. So Britain is not the only, there are many great countries around the world, but they are the minority, Aaron, of the 193 countries in the world, they are the minority. And I think one of the things that is interesting, we can't take Britain's economic future for granted. It's gonna be hard navigating outside the EU. It's gonna be hard without these free trade agreements of the United Kingdom and India, for sure, absolutely. It's gonna be hard trying to navigate doing business to a China given given its egregious human rights abuses, and it's only getting worse and worse and worse. So, um, but that said, it's gonna be hard with Russia uh, being uh, increasingly aggressive. But that said, Aaron, what I do think being outside the European Union does, it, it actually raises, it shines a light actually on the, on the, on the independence of what the United Kingdom brings to the international community, both in hard and soft power both with its diplomatic missions and its cultural exchanges and its universities and the, say the BBC World Service and its whole not-for-profit sector, which is brilliant at focusing on human rights and conservation. And at the same time, having a steely, realistic outlook about the nature of threats to people everywhere, but especially those who reside in the free world. And provided those, those, the hard power continuities continue and people don't get complacent, and the soft power, the soft power aspects are invested in and not divested, then I think that's the best hope for the United Kingdom to chart a future path in the international community in spite of being outside the EU and in spite of facing very difficult challenges. But we mustn't be overconfident. And um, I don't think the United Kingdom um, can be much in the world without partnership. There are wonderful partners the United Kingdom has in Europe, outside of Europe, especially in North America, but also elsewhere around the world, throughout the Commonwealth. And I think um, it's about partnership and friendship, facing those things together, looking for mutual benefits, economic mutual benefits, security and defence mutual benefits. Uh, and so no, no country, is, uh, no country, whilst we're an island, Aaron, no country is metaphorically an island in the international community. Understood. Let me, let me ask you a follow up question on that. So, uh, and this is purely my opinion, but, uh, but Her, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth wielded a tremendous amount of soft power. Yep. How do you, how do you see King Charles filling those proverbial shoes? Great question. Um, very good question. I'm very encouraged by his first statement that he said that his role will change and that he would imitate his mother. He would imitate the, the practice and attitude of his mother. I was very, you know, you know, I was very encouraged by that. Why? I think it's fair to say that His Majesty, when he was Prince of Wales, was an, quite an activist on a number of areas. 
he would write letters to the main broadsheet newspapers, the Telegraph, the Times, <laughs> the Guardian, and um, put his view and put uh, Clarence House's view, so to speak. Um, personally, I would prefer him never to do that because I'm an old fashioned constitutionalist and I believe in the constitutional monarchy and I don't think you that, that that's best with all due respect to him. Actually, that would be my view. Um, but he said his role's changed. And so what we're expecting is that will not happen anymore because he's the monarch and you, the monarch is above, above the fray, the political fray. And, and when the constitutional monarchy works at its best, it's precisely that. You have a head of state that is not involved in grubby politics, that you have to think, oh my gosh, is he gonna say this? Or has, he, has, she, has she not said that or what have you? And, and oh, they're, ju they're just doing that. They're making this a partisan party political issue rather than something else. So to be honest, I, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic. That he's um, that he's learned. He's had the longest apprenticeship, Aaron. He's had the longest apprenticeship. So I'm I'm hoping he will he will follow um, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II's example. Um, and he and and there might be other members of the royal family who have got a bit more liberty. Maybe maybe his son, the Prince of Wales, Prince William, who, who will be able to to take on other issues. Um, but they, ha I do think I I'm not so. Some of my colleagues are a bit more relaxed about that. Some of my colleagues are Republicans. Some of my uh, other of my colleagues think, no, no, no. If it's on the issues we like, we like them to champion that. I don't. I'm a straight down the line constitutionalist, and I think there's a danger to do that because the strength of the constitutional monarchy is being above the fray. Thank you so much. We have a an, another question here about uh, voter turnout in the UK. And the question is, with the Brexit vote being the only exception since the late 90, 1990s, uh, voter turnout has been low in the UK. Why do you think that is? Often it's low because of often it's low because of the politics of contentment. It was incredibly low in two thousand and one under Tony Blair. Um, people were broadly content with, content with the economics. The Tories were heavily divided. Uh, Labour was still on the new Labour. It was still not quite a honeymoon period, but it was before the Iraq War, for example, when popularity went south. So sometimes it's the politics of contentment. Sometimes it's also um, it's low because people think, well, it doesn't really matter. We've only got two parties. Now that's an error, but that might be an error, an, an innocent error. It's an error. Oh, we've only got two parties. They don't represent me. Well, what we clearly have is two party, great parties of state, as they're called. But they, the Conservative Party is meaningfully three different political parties. The Labour Party is meaningfully two. So you've in effect got five intellectual traditions, five ideological traditions. And, and in the last few years, we've seen them all. Um, we've seen not all in government, but we've seen all of them in, in, in office. We've seen the Labour opposition led by the left socialist, uh, Jeremy Corbyn. And now you've got more of like the progressive the more sort of Labour right progressive Akir Starmer. The, the, the party of Liz Truss with this form of economics um, is, is very different to Boris Johnson and how much money that Rishi Sunak spent. He spent more money than British, any British government had ever spent. Now that was due to COVID, but there were still choices about propping up businesses and, and, um, and giving uh, cash payments to people who, were out, who couldn't get to work. The, the, the attitude of, the attitude of um, David Cameron towards Europe as a conservative was incredibly different to Boris Johnson. One was in, one was out. So there's a there's often a, a fallacy that doesn't change votes doesn't don't change anything because you just got two parties. You don't you don't, but you have five expressions arguably. But one thing that is a fair point, which does affect turnout sometimes, and you have all, you also have this in many countries. I know you have this in the United States, is if you live as a uh, a voter in an incredibly safe seat, let's say of the Labour Party, but you're a conservative voter, you might think, what's the point of voting? Because we, you only, you know, we have a, you know, a single member plurality system, so you just need one vote more than your opponent, and you win the seat. So if you've got a majority of eighteen thousand in the opposition, and you get three thousand, then if you're, if you're, if you want to vote for the opposition, you might think, what's the point? So those three factors. Those three factors are normally the reasons that political scientists would point to. Thanks so much. So uh, obviously the, the majority of our audience, uh, perhaps the entirety of our audience are, are Americans. Um, I'd be interested in hearing a little bit about how 
the, uh, the US-UK relationship is going currently? Uh, what are some potential strengths down the road? What are some potential dangers for that relationship? I, th I think the, the strengths are continuities, which generally speaking, um, carry on regardless of the occupant of the Oval Office. Um, NATO commitments to um, Five Eyes, so secure internet, intelligence sharing, security sharing, have, and being aware of our uh, concerns, I guess, about Russia and also about China. So the th things like that, I think, kind of can pretty much regardless. Um, other things about trade, trade deals, that's very much um, administration specific. And I think it's fair to say um, that uh, President Biden's administration is certainly less supportive. I mean, probably like more like President Obama's administrations, particularly the second administration, much less disposed to the United Kingdom as a as a partner and a place. And um, why that is, I think there were different reasons. I think there was some kind of post-colonial kind of um, center-left post-colonial kind of thinking for President Obama uh, about that, given his father and given everything like that, and given, I think, just kind of his kind of politics. I think with President Biden, it's probably the questions of Ireland and 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 you know, probably wanting a united Ireland and uh, and this whole Northern Irish. Uh, uh, protocol thing sorted. So I, I think it's kind of the domestic politics of the Democratic Party, which is perfectly understandable. These are Democrat politicians. But as the Democrat Party perhaps has moved more to the left over the years and doesn't really have a more sort of a, um, a blue dog sort of like small conservative Democrat tradition, then um, so, some of these issues, these more cultural issues that impact Britain, uh, come to the fore in both those administrations. I mean, that's what I would say. I can't really imagine I mean, this certainly wasn't the case under Clinton. Bill Clinton was an Anglophile. He was an Anglophile, uh, a very close relationship with Tony Blair. Uh, now, yes, he was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford and everything as well. Also, Jimmy Jimmy Carter, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty pro-British as well. So. Well, I, I know we've been kind of shifting from governments to monarchy and back, and I apologize for the whiplash, but we have another question that's more um, on the on the monarchy side of things which is uh, there have been some continuing discussions in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand to part ways in terms of having you know, King Charles as head of state. So from the, I guess, from, from the standpoint of the, your average Canadian, your average Kiwi, what, what are the pros and cons of, of having, uh, having a, a, a monarch, what, what may be viewed as a distant monarch? As, yeah, well, I think it's right and proper that any um, democratic society, if its elected politicians want to have a referendum about uh, whether it should have um, the British monarch as head of state or, or transition to a being a republic is absolutely right and proper for, for, for free people in free countries. That's exactly right and proper. So, of course, if, if that happens, as it has, as it's been happening in more and more in the Caribbean, um, then that's right and proper. Uh, what are the advantages? I think the advantages are you don't have to elect a head of state. You don't have you don't have to have someone. You can rest assured that it's not someone partisan. Um, we all know that presidents can be difficult, and because uh, they are trying to be head of government as well as head of state, and those things are often muddied and clouded. And uh, I know a lot of my American friends have been concerned about about those questions in the recent past. So that's one point. I think the other point is about Britain in particular, rather than just the uh, the institution of a constitutional monarch. I think. Um, you don't find any countries that have Britain as a head of state that have a distant relationship from the United Kingdom. And that's quite important, not just in terms of trade and diplomacy, but potentially also security. That said, um, you have uh, in, in Mozambique, a country who was never in the British Empire, joining uh, the Commonwealth. Right. So just because a country might say, like Barbados is going to, when we're going, do not want uh, the British monarch as head of state, we're going to be a republic. There, there's no there's no discussion about them leaving the Commonwealth because that's also advantageous for trade and for diplomacy and all that kind of stuff. So I think for a number of countries, it just brings them, it gives them another block, another diplomatic trading block. It gives them support um, on a whole range of issues. And again, Britain is not um, one of the two great powers of the world. We've talked about China and, of course, the United States. 
But as your series shows, you're doing a series on global powers. Britain still is a significant power. So, you know, um, there's another reason why countries might want to stay close. But they could be republics and still be in the Commonwealth and and, and have a, and a particularly close, not all of the members of the Commonwealth are as close as others, of course. Um, but um, that is a, that's a feasible walk. That's a feasible journey they could take from being, uh, you know, ha having a shared sovereign to being a republic, but still being an active member of the Commonwealth. But there, there might be other reasons why they decide, actually, do you know what? The grass is sometimes greener. And if you have a head of state who's also the head of government, that can be very tricky, as I think we all know. Well, Dr. Beach, I realize we are coming up to the uh, the top of the hour here. Um, I just want to say thank you so much. I appreciate your insights. I appreciate hearing about the continuities, the discontinuities, the challenges and aspirations. Uh, it's been, from, from my personal standpoint, it's been a fantastic discussion. I really appreciate you making the time. And I know that Matthew has a couple of closing thoughts as well. Uh, but before he does that again, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Aaron. Lovely to speak with you. Dr. Beach and Aaron, thank you so much for your time today. What a fascinating look at the United Kingdom and where things are going from here. Uh, Dr. Beach, as we were talking about earlier, it's just sort of a, a really a tricky time in a lot of ways for the United Kingdom. And you've laid out a, a really clear uh, plan for us of, of how that might be able to move forward. So really, really appreciate your uh, insights today. And we appreciate everyone who joined us, uh, whether live during the program today, or we'll view this recording later. Uh, we hope you'll join us for the rest of the Global Motivation Series, as well as other upcoming programs at the International Relations Council. You can find out more on our website at irckc.org. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you very soon.